Okay, so um, I guess just to start, um, obviously this is just the introductory webinar, so I guess I don't expect to get into too much detail um, about NetEx itself on this call, I guess. Um, there is a section essentially about the document and the timeline for the consultation process. I'll stop for some questions then, and then I'm going to delve into the the headline requirements, uh, the headlines around the specific parts of NetEx that were making specifications on and I guess what what that means for bus operators, data producers, I think, because I mean, I've noticed a few on the call. Um, we're quite a varied group, but I think it's important that we can always refer back to the people that are obliged to produce this data and try and sort of explain what it means in straightforward terms. So I'm going to try and do that. I mean, in terms of stopping the questions halfway through, Tim, what do you think? Emma, you think I should do that or just? Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's probably sensible. All right, cool. On we go then. OK, so there's a bit of background um, about why we're doing this and what it all means. Um, as we know, bus operators are required to publish their first ticketing as open data. Um, and the UK NetX profile was uh, sort of developed to facilitate that. Now, NetX, as we know as well, is a it, it's, it's a new thing in the public transport industry, the bus industry. Um, and because of its highly flexible and modular nature, this has had a few sort of early implications um, that we're trying to address through this profile. You know, what we've found is that a lot of the fares data published um, from various suppliers came in many different structures and there are lots of different variations in content because obviously, like I've said, NetEx is very, very flexible, very modular, and you can essentially pass extremely limited amounts of data and be considered valid or you can divide that data up across multiple files. You could do all kinds of different things. Um, and that's what was happening when the data was being published. Obviously, this posed quite a big challenge for anybody trying to consume the data because you have to account for all the different variations. Um, and there was an unknown number, unknown number of variations. So to address this, um, BODs you know, are implementing a more restricted version of the NetEx profile, um, which now covers both simple and complex fares. Um, and I think, you know, the headline reasons for this is obviously that we need a greater standardization of the file structures. Um, you know, we were seeing um, situations where elements related to products were split across multiple files, which obviously made it very difficult to pass the data. Um, like I said, we were seeing fair data being published with very minimal um, content beyond the prices and the name of the product. So we're going to we're implementing minimum levels of content to improve you know the sort of detail and consistency of the data so we're talking about you know what kind of product is it what kind of passengers it applied to and relating this back to um the public transport network um and that goes into the third headline which is establish standardized methods of re referencing external data sets i mean i'll get into that in a minute but obviously you know when you are uh, if you think about um, a fair product someone buys it a passenger buys it it grants them certain rights to access the public transport network um, in terms of routes and stops and things like that. So obviously we are we are relying on the trans exchange data and the NAPTAN data um, to express those um, in this profile. So um, that'll be addressed later on. So in terms of documentation, uh, as I said, I think, you know, I've already received communications about the consultation uh, with concerns about, I guess, the very technical and obtuse nature of um, the document itself um, and that perhaps those who are obliged to produ publish data are essentially left um, no better informed than they were previously. Um, so that's that's recognised. Um, we have already gone through a, a small internal consultation. So, you know, the document has been circulated around um, the BODS team. It's been circulated to Ticketer and VIX and, of course, uh, the data standards SME, our generous host, Tim. They've all seen this document and provided feedback already. So we're on version four of the document. Um, but to address the, the issue that I, I raised earlier, which is about obviously the lack of accessibility uh, in terms of this document, um, you know, we're not going to change the document itself. The document is still going to continue as it is just to describe the NetX structure and the content of those structures um, as expected when published to VODs and what sort of validation is being run on that. But we will be, you know, at the end of the consultation, um, providing better documentation, I guess, and in terms of a, a beginner's guide type document to NetEx to accompany it, to, to, to help those 
who are less familiar or don't have the time or resources to put into understanding this document to give them a greater understanding of NetEx. And we'll also be marking up use cases for all specific product types that we're aware is on sale in England um, to help support you know, a greater understanding of the data and obviously you know, the end goal, which is to drive take up from NetEx and actually um, get some value from this data. So in terms of the consultation itself, um, the time is quite short. Um, and I, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. I think that um, you know it will help bring a bit of greater focus. And um, this is very much the uh, the introductory webinar. So you know there will be questions at the end, but I think the second webinar, which will be held on the 29th, um, the agenda will be more informed by the feedback I receive between now and then, so we can address maybe have more detailed conversations about specific issues. Um, the closing date for feedback is March the 6th um, and then we're allowing a two week turnaround to March 20th um, to make all the changes and updates um, that come out of this process um, issue a final profile document um, and that will be essentially covering what we expect to be published on BODS and any future validation rules we implement will be based off of that document and won't vary from it um, without further consultation. Um, and as we know, I mean, it's, it's Easter time, so we're looking at a final webinar to go over the profile and I guess have another Q&A about it. Um, but that might happen in April time, um, you know, to not clash with Easter holidays and allow people to to attend. Um, so just going back to, you know, I think this is a key point which I put in the introduction, you know. Um, as we've said, a fair product gives you right to, to, to access services. And you can access those at certain stops. So we need to think about how this NetEx relates to Trans Exchange and NAPTAN. The UK profile of NetEx actually allows you to define, um, you know, basic route and timetable data. But of course, as this is already being done um, in Trans Exchange, you know, we are keeping the requirements for route and timetable data to a minimum um, in the FAIRS NetEx, and we're very much trying to leverage what already exists. Um, in the BODS Trans Exchange PTI profile. So when we're talking about routes and services, we're, we're going to be using uh, referencing and stuff that already exists in the PTI profile um, in order to reference the data back to the route and timetable data. And the same goes for stops. You know, we're expecting stops that are declared in a NetEx file to be from NAPTAN and use the ATCO code. However, we recognise that there are obviously exceptions to this um, and the PTI profile has established a precedent which I put present, which is obviously not useful. I'll change that typo later. Um, yeah, we, we're going to follow the precedent that's already established in the Trans Exchange PTI profile um, for stops that aren't in NAPTAN, um, which does allow non NAPTAN points to be created, I guess, with an expectation that they're not going to be there for very long. Um, so before I go into the uh, NetEx content and structure itself, I'm going to take a quick pause and see if anybody has any questions. Do we have any hands up? I can't actually see because I've got um No, not yet. I'll take that as I know at this point then. Um and then um get back to actually talking through the NetEx. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through the um the basics of NetEx, the content and the structure and things. Um and at the end, I guess we'll ask any questions. So first of all, um the document addresses file structure. As I've said, we had a known problem, which was that um, certain um, NetEx data sets were built in such a way that a ticket would have various parts of what defines a ticket spread across multiple XML files. Um, and NetEx as a standard, as I've said before, is very flexible. So it allows you to essentially spread a single fair product across multiple XML files. Or you can store an indefinite number of fair products within a single XML file. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring a bit of standardization to that. So the NetEx profile and validation rules that are applied during publication to BODS require all elements uh, relevant to a fair product to be contained in a single XML file. So what we're saying there is that the basic assumption is at minimum, we're expected to see one file for a product as the dataset structure. However, the profile is written in such a way that it does not preclude you to include large XML files that include lots of products in the same file. 
um, and that latter option, I guess, is is sometimes preferable when you're dealing with um, large numbers of network files, such as you know day week passes. You might want to store them in the same XML file. So the profile allows that to be done both ways. But what it specifically precludes is you separating um, parts of a product across multiple files. And um, so to talk about Netic itself at the highest level, um, and this is quite an important point, is that um, you, you know Netex as a schema allows or it, it uses something called version frames. These are large element sets um, that use as containers to group all kind of other related elements together. And as I said before, Netex allows things like routes and timetables to be defined. So not all of the frames that are allowed in Netex are going to be used in the Netex bolt profile. Um, because we're we'll trying to keep some of it to a minimum, you know, the sort of things that we're expecting in terms of defining lines and stops, uh, keeping those things to a minimum. Um, so what uh, what we would expect to see in a NetX file is a single composite frame, and within that composite frame, we expect lots of other frames to contain the key elements that we require um, to define to fully define a product. So those frames are there's a resource frame. Um, and each frame has has a type. Um, so the resource frame has a type of UK PI common that's defined by the UK NetX profile. And the resource frame is primarily used in the Bolt profile to contain operator details. Um, so that's national national operator codes, trading names, those kinds of things. There are lots of additional optional elements that are explained in the profile that we, we would like to see but are not considered mandatory, such as contact details, you know, for someone purchasing a fare, those kinds of things. There is a service frame, so that's got the type of PI network. So that's being used to carry um, stop details and route details. So by route details, we mean lines. Um, like I said earlier, those are referring back to Trans Exchange and NAPTAN. So the requirements are quite limited um, in terms of what's mandatory. Really, we're just looking for IDs that are traceable back to the ISO data set, then a minimum level of naming requirements. Uh, there's lots of other additional requirements that we're going to ask for, but um, you know, those are optional, um, recommended. Um, and then there's three types of fair frame. There is something called a fair network frame. So that's where you essentially group the elements that you've used higher up in the service frame into things that are usable in a fair product. So I mean, really what we're talking about there is bundling the stops up into fair zones, stages, those kinds of things for referencing later on. Um, we expect to see a fair product, fair frame. So really, that's the that's the, the most important bit. This is where you're really defining all the specifics of a fair product, its rules, its pricing structures, those kinds of things. And then the final fair frame is the fair price. So that's where you start to detail prices of the, the fair products that are defined earlier on. And you can do things like you know create um, tables for republication, fair triangles, those kinds of things. So what we're expecting to see in in every single file is the five frame types nested within a composite frame that would cover um, a single product but you can all, that would also look the same if you were doing multiple products um, you would just have multiple entries in those five frames so that covers um, all of the sort of file structure scenarios uh, versioning right so i mean i think <clears throat> versioning is quite a difficult topic um, in netex um netex itself uh, supports versioning uh, almost every level of a XML file from the top level of a composite frame down to like individual element groupings. Um, that obviously creates quite a lot of potential for variance if it's allowed to be done in any way whatsoever. And I think that unlike Trans Exchange, we don't have an easy way to create persistent identifiers for fair products and things because, of course, fair products aren't regulated. We don't have anything that we can look back to in the same way we can for timetables such as registrations. Um, to create unique and persistent IDs, so it makes it considerably more difficult. So as part of the Bosnetics profile, there is a recommended basic versioning method. However, the best approach to managing data sets, given that you don't have to publish them with any advanced timeline, is to publish all of your fares as a single data set and then just make them inactive when you publish a new data set. However, if you choose to use the versions, um, we're asking them to be done at composite frame level. So that's the that is the the part where you will create incremental increases in the versions for each new data set. But what you also need to do is actually increment every single element 
within the composite frame at the same time. Um, and the increments themselves should be absolute numbers um, rather than because it, it does allow points. But to keep it simple, we're expecting absolute numbers to be used. Um, and that the composite frames, including a file, should always have a validity condition date range. So what this does is essentially creates an active period, a beginning and an end date for everything that's contained within the composite frame, which holds all the other subframes. So moving on to network data, we keep using the phrase network, um, which is not necessarily that common sense. So really what we're saying is that that's your routes and your stops that you operate that fair product give access to. Um, so we do have some limitations, which are quite limited, but very specific. I think I've already touched on these. Um, in the resource frame, we're expecting to see operators defined. So what we're expecting there is the national operator code that's used for publishing on BODs uh, for the same operator. Um, there is some limited additional data that we need, which is names and things like that, but it's quite limited. Um, for lines, again, we're expecting you to, to reference back to what's published on BODs, um, this time in terms of trans exchange. So what we're saying is when you're saying that a product is valid on a line or a group of lines, that those lines must be defined using the exact same line ID for the equivalent in the trans exchange file that's published on BODs for the service. Um, and then for stops, as I said earlier, you know, all stops that are included should be in NAPTAM, should use the ACCO code. Um, where that isn't possible, because we know the scenarios that are around, um, it should follow the precedent established in the PTI profile for how a stop point is addressed. And any temporary stops that are included in the NETX should exist as temporary stops in the equivalent trans exchange file too. Um, and as I said before, um, all the network data of all the network data stops themselves need to be grouped up into fair zones when you're defining um, access rights of a fair product that sits in a different frame, the fair network frame. So um, I'm just going to go through the main elements that are in the um, fair product frame. Uh, the first one of which is the tariff. So the tariff is where you define a set of variables for a specific fair product structure. Again, these are very flexible in how they can be used in the UK NetEx profile. So for BODS NetEx, we're going to specify certain minimum requirements. So what we're saying there is that validity conditions need to be defined at the tariff level as well. So that will obviously allow you to um, attach different dates to different products if you're including multiple products in the same file. Um, obviously, the end date is not always known but and it's not mandatory, but um, you know you should always include it where you do know the end date. Um, we're talking about pricing structure, so there's various ways that that can be described, a type of tariff ref and a tariff basis. We're saying those must always be included because often those weren't included in the data that's being published on BODs. Um, so that's things like, you know, is it a zone fair, is it a point to point fair, is it a zone to zone fair, these kind of things. And then there's elements called fair structure elements, which I'll get to on to in a minute, but basically what we're saying is within the, within the tariff, we're expecting to see three types of fair structure to be definitively present for every single fair product. And then there are a few other fair structure elements that we expect to be there um, under certain conditions. So to talk a bit more about the fair structure elements. Um, so a fair structure element is like a, it's like a defined group of elements um, that can be used to define rules and limitations of a fair product. And these can be defined in multiple ways. I mean, I'm saying geography and bus, serv bus services, time periods there, but there's many, many different things that you can you can do. You can also describe, you can also use, use them to define access rights negatively. So rather than saying what services it does access, you can also say what services it doesn't access if it's like a network period pass, something like that. Um, so what we're saying is uh, there's three types of fair structure element that we always expect to be included in the NetX file. One which is access. Um, so that's to define your network. That's how you define the access rights of the network as we've defined define the network earlier on, so that stops and services. So the fair structure element will basically say, you know, limited to this set of services, this service, this fair zone, these sets of fair zones. Within those as well, you can also include things um, like graded price structures, distance matrix elements, which are used to define graded price for five products where you've got a fair triangle and the price increases further along your route you go. Um, we're expecting an eligibility fair structure element, so that is the fair structure element where um, you can add fair uh, passenger types and we're expecting that to be added as a limitation. 
Um, so you define your user type and user profile within the first structure element itself. And then we're talking about travel conditions. So this is quite an important one. This is used to, to define quite a lot of different limitations, such as like a number of uses. So that's where you would define whether it's a single use product or unlimited use product and things, whether it incur adds the right to uh, a return trip um, and other kind of variables like that. So that's three fair structure elements we're expecting to be there in all cases for all products. We do have a, another three sets of fair structure elements that we expect to be there under certain conditions, which are considered mandatory in certain conditions. Um, so one is durations. So this is really just to define periods of use, the temporal aspects of it uh, for any kind of past product, anything that you define as unlimited use. Um, across a certain time period. Um, we have a carne, uh, fair structure element. Oh, it's actually called carne units, but for simplicity, I've called it carne. So that's used really just, that's a very simple fair structure element used to define the number of units in any bundled fair product. And then we have groups as well, which is where you um, group together the user types that you've already defined in the eligibility fair structure element. So we'll be looking for those elements in, in the validation process. There are, as I said before, there are other fair structure elements which can be used to more efficiently define things like, um, yeah, if you, if you have a fair product where it's it covers an entire bus network, but there are a couple of express services, perhaps they're excluded, you can more efficiently define that saying, um, you know, cannot access rather than can access. Uh, but those those are allowable under the um, Bosnetic profile, but we're not really defining any way, any scenario where it must be included. So um, once you've defined the tariff and all the fair structure elements, those are all kind of bundled together in something called a fair product. So a fair product is the purchase of element available to the public that allows them to access the public transport network. Um, and it'll consist of a series of validity elements so those valid elements are essentially just referencing back to the fair structure elements we've already defined. So you can you can essentially, if you are including multiple products in the same file, mix and match the fair structure elements um, as, as as required. Um, the, this is the next point as a charging moment. Um, that's also used um, and must be included for every fair product that's published to BODS. And this is quite an important element because it's really used to define and separate uh, complex products of a type of complex products, tap and go style products, um, and those paid for at or before the moment of um, travel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are quite a limited number of charging moments, but that's something that we're going to be checking on. Um, and we'll have subsequent conditional requirements put upon it. So, for example, you know, if we're seeing um, a charging moment is a pulse pay. We might be looking for capped um, caps and things like that. Um, so there are two main types of fair products that we're expecting to see. Um, there is the pre-assigned fair product. So this is really when it says pre-assigned, this just means something that's um, known beforehand. So it's not a pulse pay product. I mean, it really covers almost all traditional products um, singles, returns, passes, all, all kinds of products, anything that's Anything that you can essentially buy um, before you travel or at the point when you start traveling. Um, we also have a type of product which is um, very imaginative title, the amount of price unit product. So what this means is you've got a product which actually consists of a series of units that can be used separately. So that's something that we use to define bundle products or carnet products, whatever you choose to call them. And then something else which is nested within the fair products that we expect to see for capping. Um, it's something called a cap discount right. So this is used to define a cap that's applied to any fair product uh, when certain levels of consumption are breeze, achieved within set time periods. Um, so this covers um, the majority of, I guess, what we call complex fares. Um, so what we're saying is the charging moment and the cap discount right essentially combined together to describe um, whether a product can be paid for um, after travel. It's a post pay product. You know the, the the price being charged is only defined once you've completed your journey and then also any sort of caps that apply. Um, now, within the cap discount, right, there's something called capping rules. Um, you can use them to define whether it's a rolling cap, whether it's a one day cap, whether it's a seven day cap, what day the, the, the cap might start on, if it's fixed with day of the week, these kind of things. So those are all included within the cap discount, right, and which is defined in the profile document. Onto the sales app package. Um, so a sales of a package is used to define 
the purchasing of a fair product. Um, and I guess we're, again, we're, we're we're mandating quite a few elements in those, um, mandating the distribution channel. So that's um, you know where a fair product can be bought. Can it be bought on the bus? Is it on a mobile phone app? These kind of things. We're mandating payment method. So that's how a fair product can be paid for. Is that cash? Is that a bank card? These kinds of things. And a type of tra travel document, which is. Um, where we define what media the fair product is available on. Um, this is quite um, not an immediately obvious um, element because the they are kind of fixed enumerations from the schema and the schema hasn't really been updated in quite a while. So the sort of modern EMV tap and go is not very well described. It's essentially described as an electric electronic document. Um, but yeah, I mean, for most of the things like paper ticket smart cards, there are good uh, values. Um, that are more immediately understandable. So yeah, we're making all of those elements mandatory, how you can buy it, where you can buy it, and how you pay for it. Um, and you can set up multiple sales of a package. I mean, the reason why this is separate from the, the product itself is so you can set up a product, but then have multiple sales of a package is because of course, sometimes the same product is available through different channels um, and has different pricing to encourage um migration from paper tickets to mobile apps and these kinds of things so that's why the sales of a package is a separate group of elements from the fair product itself even though it may seem like it's part of the same the same concept and then on to prices again as with a lot of things in netex it's extremely flexible and allows you to price all different kinds of entities uh, within the within the structure and that's what's called a priceable object and i've tended to avoid that phrase but um to, to to ensure a level of simplicity, you know, the board's profile, we only sort of look for certain objects to be pri priced. What we're generally looking for is the fair product. So going back to what I said earlier, that's the pre-assigned fair products or the amount of price unit product. Um, and a combination of that with the sales of a package is preferred to be priced. The main exception we expect to see of that is, again, going back to fair triangles and point-to-point -point singles and zone-to-zone -zone singles, we're going to expect to see distance matrix elements, which should be priced separately. Um, as I said, also, there is the cap discount right, which sits within the product, but is not a product. Obviously, a cap doesn't give you any right to travel. It's just a, a cutoff point beyond which you won't be charged anymore for traveling. Um, but these also need to be priced um, in the fair price frame. Um, and that's defined in the bottom text profile. And as one additional thing, we're requesting that or we're enforcing that prices are defined as absolute numbers. So we that is pounds and pence. Uh, rather than deriving them as percentages of other fares. The NetX UK NetX profile does allow you to derive um, prices as percentages, but of course that leads to potential confusion and giving out potentially erroneous information if odd numbers are being half by 50% of these kind of things. So what we're expecting is all prices to be defined as absolute numbers. Okay, so that's a brief run through of the um, The Botanetics Ethics Profile, um, what the document includes. Um, I guess I will open the floor to any questions at this point. Roger. Hi, Stephen. Um, when you talk about a product being broken up over multiple XML files, um, what exactly are you talking about there? Are you, are you talking about, you know, a child single, an adult single, and the inbounds and outbounds all being on different files, or are, is it more granular well, than that? Yeah, it's more atomic than that. Um, right. You know, I think actually in other countries like Norway, they do actually publish their uh, NetEx data much more fragmented than I guess the board's NetEx profile is asking for. Uh, but what I'm saying there is that those slides that I've just run through, so you've got a concept of a fair product and you've got a concept of a network, so those things are actually in different files. But at, or perhaps um, the user profile for a passenger type is in one file and then another file that defines what rules the product has and the price is sat in another file and you have to reference between the two files. So that was what we were seeing and that's what this profile is essentially intended to stop. Okay, so is the is the DFT first data tool essentially compliant with um, the model that you're proposing at the moment? Uh, it is, um, except for a couple of edge cases around the caps, which we will be addressing immediately as soon as this consultation is complete. Um, 
and we can obviously design around that because obviously th there may be amendments made to this following the consultation process so we, we're not going to do any development work to update the CFDS between now and then but it will be turned around very quickly after that. I mean do, do you have any operators that operate caps that would expect you to publish data on their behalf? I mean that seems unusual. Um, that well not case. that we publish at the moment. Um, no, we've never been asked to do that. So. OK. Um, I'm not seeing many hands, so are there any other questions at this point? Not oh, Sue. So I just want to check that. So if we've created all our data using the the government, the Create Fairs data site, then we are pretty much doing what you already want us to do anyway. We won't have to do it again. Um, unless, yeah, no, in fact, thinking about it, the, the, the capping rules are actually feature flag still. So there is no way for you currently to publish data that contravenes this profile. Now, of course, we are undergoing a consultation, so there may be changes as part of this consultation, but at, at, at the point of we're speaking now, if you use a CFDS to publish any FAIRS data, it conforms to this profile. Fine. So okay. you, you won't need to rework anything. Thank you. Um, Simon. Yeah, Steve, thanks very much. Really good uh, presentation. Um, just the, I think this follows on from the point just made. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to work out the, the, what's the big drive for moving for, from uh, to NetX right at the moment? Just, just trying to understand what the, uh, the big driver is. Um, well, I'm not really sure that's necessarily a question I can answer. Obviously, it's in the um, statutory instrument of the Bus Services Act, the, the secondary legislation. So we are essentially just trying to, I guess, um, rectify some issues that have been raised because of that, because of the flexibility of NetEx. Um, we're just trying to sort of narrow it down and make sure that people publishing to BODs are doing it in a very specific fashion for ease of consumption. I think in terms of the driver for NetEx, I mean, I think Tim might be able to better contribute on that one. I mean, it's a policy decision rather than a data driven decision. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, the 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 challenge with the landscape for how people uh, can move data around um, was the there wasn't a standard in use in the UK. Um, yeah. NetX being part of the the trans model architecture fitted with the way that routes and timetables and location data was being provided. Um, and when you looked at the landscape um, of standards out there, um, there were really only two uh, options, uh, NetX, um, which is um, you know, highly structured, um, and GTFS for fares, which uh, works okay for very simple fare structures, but in the UK we've got quite complex fare structures and would have needed uh, more extensions and adjustments to cope with UK fares than uh, would have been sensible. Um, and so uh, NetEx was uh, chosen by the department a good number of years ago now. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of evolution in terms of GTFS fares in between when the legislation was laid down and now. Um, but I think at that time, GTFS was woefully inefficient to describe um, yeah. fares in, in Britain. Yeah, it, it, thanks very much. I it was just trying to understand the, the, the now <laughs> as much as the um, overall uh, target objective. But uh, yeah, I mean, but thanks this isn't, yeah, this isn't necessarily a push for NetEx. It's a push for standardisation of yeah. uh, NetEx. Thank you. Fares. Yeah. In fairs, sorry. Yeah, sorry. To, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions at this point? Before I get on to um, feedback mechanisms. No. OK. So, um, yeah, in terms of feedback, um, like I said, we set out the dates and timelines. Um, the cutoff date is the 6th of March. Oh, sorry, Sue, is that a legacy hand or are you put up hand again? Just behind him now. 
I think I've got my hand up, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's okay. So I think it's because I resized my window, it just reappeared. Oh, okay. um, um, so yeah, as we said before, the um, the timeline for this consultation is uh, finishing on the 6th of March. Um, there will be a second workshop next week where I guess I want to delve into um, things in a bit more detail, specific issues. What those specific issues are, I do have an idea already, but there will be um, scope for new issues to be raised from the feedback that I receive between now and then. Um, I would ask that all feedback is sent as emails, points in emails, rather than uh, marking up the document with comments and sending it back to me. Um, it'll just make it much easier to turn around if it's in an email format. Um, and all emails, send them to my personal email address. So that's stephen.pen at kpmg.co.uk. Um, so if you have something specific um, that you want delving into in more detail and discussing amongst all the stakeholders, um, yeah, please raise, well, please send it to me in the next week so I can get it ready for the, the next webinar on the 29th of February. So uh, there was a question about presentation making uh, making that available. Um, so we will email that out to attendees and put it on the PTIP website and um, the uh, the recording of the session will be uh, put up there as well uh, uh, in the next sort of day and a bit, something like that. So I'm just looking at the comments in the chat, which I've not seen yet from Simon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, in in the specific use case of London, it is a bit challenging in terms of NLCs. You know, again, because we're going back to the Trans Exchange. You know, the Trans Exchange at the moment, as it's required in BODS, is based around all licenses and things like that and registrations, which obviously, isn't it? I mean, it makes sense from the perspective of publishing, I mean, of uh, the publication of data, but it doesn't make sense from the consumption of data to my to my mind. It makes it very difficult to work out what a red bus is or in London, or, sorry, in Manchester, what a yellow bus is um, and how you attribute that. Um, but in terms of the NetEx, we will just be following the national operator codes set out in the transition PTI profile. I mean, I don't know, if, Tim, if there's been any, any movement on that TFL NLC. Is it the idea that the National Operator Code will always just be? Um, or how how franchise organisations can better be dealt with in trans, trans exchange? Uh, well, we worked through the how Manchester are approaching it. Others have slightly different that are talking about franchising may end up with slightly different arrangements and we'll have to um, deal with those as they occur but fundamentally for fares it's going to be whoever is responsible for setting the fares you know so um, and where those are valid those tickets um, yeah. as to what knock is probably the most appropriate um, I mean, the first data is kind of downstream of proven timetable data, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess it is possible for you to define an organization separately that's not an operator um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and use TFLO as the national operator code. In fact, I'll probably note that down and actually add that to the profile document as a specific use mm -hmm. case, I think, because yeah, I think it's important that people know the 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 one of the things to consider uh, in all of this is how the data links together across the different data sets yeah. so whatever approach ends up being taken for fares needs to be consistent with the data for timetables and location data because at some point it's all got to be matched up um if we're going to provide information that's sensible to the customer and, and yeah. i think Thank you, Tim. That I think that's my concern is that the volatility, you know, if go past day one a minute, let's assume day one, all the fares are loaded, all fabulous. Day two, 
all of these franchising authorities will be changing routes between operators. That's the whole purpose of one of, well, not the whole purpose, but that will be a, a byproduct of the way they're franchising. You know, we have to think about change, change of routes, change of operators, all of these items and linking all of that together. That's always been the challenge under BODS. And we, we as much as possible, we want to make sure that the constructs on the data here don't impede the, the need to make those changes as and when required. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think obviously the way we've laid out the profile doesn't really limit you in that respect at the moment, but I will add some additional wording around these kind of franchised cases and how might be the best way to address that. Um, OK, I mean, I guess what I'll also say on top of, um, you know, my request for feedback, obviously we would like feedback on the decisions made around the structure of NetEx. And, you know, obviously I've I've very much restricted quite a lot of what things can do. But what I'm also interested in, I guess, is feedback around the documentation itself um, and the supporting documentation that I've mentioned in terms of use cases and uh, a simpler kind of how to guide. If people have any suggestions or questions about that as well, I'd encourage you to send them over. Um, so the document is, all the supporting documents are pitched at the right level, because I'm aware that obviously, you know, some of the people that produce data are really just, you know, they're just inputting data into UI or the, you know, using systems that they bought from someone else and don't necessarily understand what's going on underneath the hood. Um, so yeah, the feedback can be not just about the content of the document, but also the nature of, the support and documentation that we're offering. Well, unless anyone has any questions at this point, um, I think the only ask is to, if you are interested, to read the document and um, feedback. I guess, I guess the only um, question would be, is there any and a sample of data that is already compliant with the profile that you could share in advance, just so this is sorry, Dave Mountain from Transport API. So we could test to see how it works with our existing um, uh, parsers and check how compliant we are with that. I, th I think we, like a lot of people, have been somewhat hamstrung by trying to account for so many different um, uh, data structures and really support this move. But um, if there is a sample you could give us, even in the back channel, that said it's going to look like this, I think that might be helpful my point of view and help us prepare for the new profile and help us give us more specific feedback which is always difficult until you actually get your hands dirty yeah all right thanks david um i mean it was um either yours or jonathan raper's comments early on which was a driver of this entire profile i think uh flagging up the inconsistencies um yeah there is there is a single ticket uh point to point ticket example which is actually in the appendices um but obviously that's a very specific use case um when we issue the final document like i said there the will be there will be something around use cases included because obviously uh, different kinds of products look very different in the netex so i'd need to supply you with quite a lot of different um example files like i said there is one in the um, service now um and all data produced by the CFDS is also um, conforming to the profile. I mean, is there any specific fair types that you're looking at? I mean, I know you had very specific use cases years ago. Uh, no, I think we I think we'd be taking a fresh look. I feel like we we've done an implementation and we've um, which which deliberately narrowed the use case and we'd be looking to expand it out. Um, but no, I think it. I, I mean, I. I approve all of this. I think uh, narrowing it down, making it more specific is useful. Knowing this profile will help us a lot. Um, I don't think there's a yeah. lot more we can feedback at the moment. OK, I mean, you know, one of the jobs that I'll be doing while the concert is going on is marking up some um, some samples of complex fares, so by which I mean like specifically capped and how caps can be defined. Um, so. Yeah. What I'll try and do is share a zipper files before the next Q&A um, on the 29th, send it out to, I don't know, how do you suggest we do that, Tim? I could... We'll put a zip on the PTIC website and then people can pull it off. 
Yeah, all right. I'll do that. Well, I mean, I'll knock up a few um, singles returns, passes, and then caps, canes, these kind of things that are new and additional. Um, and then get them shared. Try and share them 27th, maybe a couple of days before the next Q&A, so you've had a chance to look um, and ask any questions. That'd be really useful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to give you loads to do, but it's going to be difficult to give specific feedback until we see what works. <laughs> it's fine. Well, I mean, I'll... I'll just use the CFDS to manufacture most of them and just then hand hand code them uh, accordingly to, to the requirements. So it's, it's not going to be a massive job. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else before we um, call it a day? Tim, do you think there's anything else we need to cover? No. Okay, well, um, Thank you all for joining, um, and I hope that I'll receive lots of emails from you um, to show that you've read it and, uh, you know, think that I've had some terrible ideas. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you all, um, and I'll give you 10 minutes back.